So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On uh, behalf of LTI, I welcome you all for this uh, webinar on the glove and the mirror metaphors to explore Shakespeare. Uh, so before we move on to the session, I request the audience to uh, watch the prom clip of LTI. Thank you, participants, for watching the prom clip of uh, ELTA. So we have with us uh, Dr. Ashwati A, Assistant Professor of English and uh, NSS College of, for Women, Trivandrum. She'll be moderating uh, the first part of the uh, webinar. Uh, so before we, I hand over the mic to her, I have a few announcements to the participants. We have a chat, chat facility here for us to uh, exchange ideas on the topic being discussed. And during the question answer session, you can post your question there. So it should be answered by the speaker. Uh, I request the participants to not share your personal uh, details like your phone numbers or uh, your email IDs on the chat. So thank you. So with this, I hand over the session to uh, Dr. Ashwati. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Sam, sir. Am I audible? Sure. 
A warm and pleasant uh, evening, one and all, and welcome to the 62nd webinar of ELTA. With me, I have uh, Dr. Aisha Sobnake, who is Assistant Professor of English and who has been working in the field for more than two decades. She is working at uh, Haru College, Kurikot, Kerala, and she is a moderator with me here in this evening. And I welcome Aisha to this uh, webinar. Now to the speaker of the day and to the topic. With us today, we have Mrs. Talita Matthew, who is a passionate teacher, a brilliant journalist, and whatnot, a consultant of English language teaching, who has been associating with British Council of India for a long time. So talking to her other day was an experience for me because uh, I could know her relentless passion for teaching literature, learning literature. And uh, ma'am headed the English department in the British school in Colombo, and her experiences uh, while teaching the A-level and also the IB classes, help her to mold her own strategies of teaching literature in different levels of, uh, for different levels of learners. And she had a short training in Australia on English language teaching that also helped her to mold her own strategies. Then she is closely associated with the Kochi reading room. So this made her close to the works of Shakespeare, which she was al already passionate about. And as I understand this uh, reading room, uh, they celebrate Shakespeare's day and also um, on his birthday and they enact plays and they sing songs with accompaniment. So that's, uh, that, was, that again helped her to know more about the Bard of Heaven. And as you know, the title of the webinar is Glow and the Mirror Metaphors to Explore Shakespeare. I'm sure she'll be introducing us to the metaphors of rereading Shakespeare. So on behalf of ELTA, on behalf of each and everyone present here, I welcome you, ma'am, to this webinar and over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwati. That was very kind of you. I hope I can live up to all that. Good evening, gentles all, as Shakespeare might say. Welcome to this short excursion into the world of William Shakespeare. A big thank you to Eltai, the host, and the moderators this evening, and the, the organizers for all their work behind the scenes, giving me a chance to share some insights with you today. Whether you are a professor or a student or just a lover of drama, I would like to highlight for you two metaphors, the glove and the mirror, which will help you to explore the plays, the characters, and the society of Shakespeare's day. First, let's take a look at this Google Doodle for 2016, exactly 400 years after Shakespeare's death. It's a fun fact that April 23rd, the date of his death was also the, uh, the, the date of his death happened to be the date of his birth 52 years earlier. It may seem a strange coincidence, but it's true. Born in 1564, in the time of good Queen Bess, Elizabeth I, he lived on till 1616, well into the reign of King James I of England and VI of Scotland, 52 years. Not much for our time, but life expectancy was lower in those days. Let's take a closer look at the doodle. Starting from the left, you will observe Hamlet talking to the skull of his father's jester, Yorick. Maybe you can enter into your chat boxes the names of the other players you can identify. They're all numbered. Do you have any guesses about the names of the plays. Right? So I think we've got a couple of, uh, quite a few answers, really. Uh, so that's right. One is Julius Caesar with Brutus all set to stab his friend. 
Then two, yes, that's uh, Romeo and Juliet, of course, with the romantic balcony scene. Three, do we have any? Okay, that's Othello uh, with uh, someone dropping the famous handkerchief. Four is Tempest. Five, Macbeth. You see the three sinister witches. Six, King Lear. And seven, of course, is a, a Midsummer Night's Dream with Bully Bottom crowned with his donkey's head. So though this is a very small cross-section, it gives us an idea of the sheer variety of Shakespeare's creative output. With at least 37 plays and 150 sonnets attributed to him. Historical plays, uh, tragedies, comedies, sonnets, songs included in his plays. The Bard of Avon was indeed very creative. Considering the magnitude of his achievements over a mere 20 years or so, from the 1590s to 1630, 13, which was when he retired. Shakespeare's birthday, April 23rd, is celebrated every year by book reading groups, as Ashwati mentioned, literary societies and publishing houses the world over, including in India. So this year, it so happened that a British book publishing society, um, house, Dempsey and Windle, organized Shakespeare's birthday poetry party 2021 via Zoom. Uh, some of us attended it and we really enjoyed it. On this occasion, several contemporary poets were asked to recite passages or sonnets by the Bard and also to read their own poems inspired by Shakespeare or as a tribute to him. One of these poets was Jeremy Loins, who read a poem addressed colloquially to Will Shakespeare. It was called How. Now, on the right, of course, you see uh, the Druchout portrait of Shakespeare from the first folio. Note his high forehead, the well-marked features, and the Elizabethan collar or ruff, very typical of what people wore in those days. And here you see a pair of beautiful Elizabethan gloves with a lot of embroidery. None of our gloves today are anything as beautiful as this. So I've been asked several times what was the relevance of the glove, and now uh, I'd like to explain. The poem by Jeremy Loins, entitled How, first gave me the idea of a glove as a metaphor for exploring Shakespeare. He also mentions the mirror, how the bard reflected the society of his day. So I've used this poem as a framing device to explain how the glove and the mirror can be used to interpret Shakespeare. So what was so special about the glove? Shakespeare's father, John, was a prominent figure in Stratford, a businessman, and among his activities was glove making. So the idea of John, the glove maker, making gloves stitch by stitch and turning the glove inside out, finger by finger, suggests what his son William was to do later not with gloves, but with the characters he set upon his stage. Now, part of this uh, idea of the glove is that the, the glove is stitched on the inside, right? And then you have to turn it inside out. But what Shakespeare really did was the opposite. He was turning his characters from the outside in, and he was giving us a look at what was happening within the character, the emotions and the motivation. Uh, and this is part of uh, what I'm going to explore today. So this is the poem. It's an excerpt from the poem by Jeremy Loins. And I hope you enjoy it as, as much as I do. It's entitled, How? How will? How was it that you knew us all so well? You, the country boy, the glove maker's son from nowhere, backwater Bill from sleepy Stratford. Wasn't that what they first thought of you, those other writers? Before the ink was dry, they weren't scoffing anymore. And was it there in a not so sleepy Stratford workshop, making gloves finger by finger, you first learned to turn us 
inside out to reveal our inner fabric, our hopes, despairs, our jealousies and secret dreams, rough, misshapen, flawed, mistaken, coming apart at the seams. So let's pause for a moment to look at those other writers. So it does mention that before the ink was dry, they weren't scoffing anymore. But who were these other writers? They seem to have sneered at poor backwater Bill from Sleepy Stratford, among other things. So let's glance at those other writers. They were the university wits. They had gone to Oxford and Cambridge, and Shakespeare had only gone to grammar school. So they thought that they were wonderful, and they just couldn't understand how Shakespeare was making such an impact. So this is what Robert Greene wrote in 1592 in his book, A Growth's Worth of Wit. There is an upstart crow beautified with our feathers. So he doesn't name the person. He's rather mysterious about it, an upstart crow. But he does say that he was beautified with our feathers, meaning he thinks that Shakespeare has borrowed uh, plots and material from the other um, uh, from the other writers of the time. And who were these other writers? Green, of course, who incidentally wrote this because I think he must have been green with jealousy. Then Nash, John Lyley, Thomas Lodge, George Peel, and Christopher Marlowe, the most famous of them all, next only to Shakespeare. So you see that um, although um, Green's intention was to insult Shakespeare, he has to admit that he was the only Shake scene in the country. Meaning, he shook the boards. He was a success on stage. He also said that he was an absolute Johannes factotum, meaning a jack of all trades. But that also meant that Shakespeare was very versatile. He not only wrote plays, he also acted in them. And here is a reference to Shakespeare's blank verse. Blank verse, of course, is unrhymed iambic pentameter. You'll be hearing quite a bit of it today. But Shake, uh, Christopher Marlowe was also famous for his blank verse, which was also known as uh, Marlowe's Mighty Line. So now let's go back to what Jeremy Loins was talking about. He was no university wits, wit. So how are our inner selves revealed by Shakespeare? This poet playwright who had learned the glove maker's art of turning the human heart inside out. I thought we could focus on two passages, one showing Othello at the zenith of happiness and the other in the depths of jealousy. The noble Moor wins honor and respect in Venice through his military victories. Uh, here on the right, you can see Othello looking a little grim. I don't know why. And there are a couple of Venetian courtyards in the background, courtiers looking rather respectfully at him. But remember that Othello is not just a foreigner. He was a Moor, an African. He was black and had to fight the social stereotypes in Venice where this play was set. A figure of romance to Desdemona who flouts her father's wishes and defies the prejudices of her day in choosing this rough soldier. It's a lovely love story. Unfortunately, it all went wrong. But what Othello knew is that she loved me for the dangers I had passed and I loved her that she did pity them. So now let's look at the height of joy. Othello expresses himself with all the force of his passionate character. Othello, 
Act two, scene one, Cyprus, on meeting Desdemona after a stormy sea journey. It gives me wonder, great is my content to see you here before me. O oh, my soul's joy, if after every tempest come such calms, may the winds blow till they have wakened death, and let the laboring bark climb hills of seas, Olympus high, and duck again as low as hells from heaven. If it were now to die, to a now to be most happy, for I fear my soul hath her content so absolute that not another comfort like to this succeeds in unknown fate. Uh, before we go on, I'd like to clarify for the students that bark, as in the laboring bark, it doesn't refer to the bark of a tree, but to a wooden boat or ship. They refer to it climbing hills of seas and being tossed on the sea. And I've highlighted in red all the words that signal Othello's joy and in purple, the hint of trouble to come in the unknown future. So you see all the words that are highlighted in red, wonder, content, comfort, Desdemona is his soul's joy, but she is also Othello's Achilles' heel, and Iago knows it well. And this is why there is this hint, uh, the sinister hint of what may happen in unknown fate. It's true that uh, since we know the plot, we know what is going to happen, but Othello, poor guy, he just had an inkling. And then we have the metaphor of the struggling ship. The struggling ship, which was being tossed to the heights of Olympus, Olympus being the mountain where the Greek gods were supposed to dwell in unclouded bliss. And then falling to, into the abyss. This probably indicates the hellish depths of jealousy that Othello was going to experience. <clears throat> so here we come to one of the most beautiful and pathetic scenes in the play. Shakespeare in Act 5 shows us the inner recesses of Othello's heart. He shows us the suspicions it harbors along with the love that is sort of gearing up now to kill the one it cherishes. Also notice how Othello insists that what he is about to do is justified. It is the cause. It is the cause, my soul. He repeats this thrice. <clears throat> Othello, Act 5, Scene 2. It is the cause. It is the cause, my soul. Let me not name it to you, you chase stars. It is the cause. Yet I'll not shed her blood, nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow and smooth as monumental alabaster. Yet she must die, else she'll betray more men. Put out the light, and then put out the light. If I quench thee, thou flaming minister, I can again thy former light restore, should I repent me. But once put out thy light, thou cunningest pattern of excelling nature, I know not where is that Promethean heat that can thy light relume. When I have plucked the rose, I cannot give it vital growth again, it must needs wither. I'll smell it on the tree. Be thus when thou art dead, and I will kill thee and love thee after. So Othello takes us into the mind of a murderer. It is practically a guided tour. And we have many clues to the conflict within Othello, not the Sherlock Holmesian kind of clues with cigarette butts and fingerprints, 
but verbal clues and cues. So I've already spoken about it is the cause where Othello is trying to convince himself that there is a reason why he is going to do this terrible deed. And then he says, yet I'll not shed her blood, nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow. Isn't it ironical that Othello, a seasoned warrior who must have killed hundreds of uh, people in his day, hundreds of men in his day, now cannot bring himself to shed his wife, wife's blood nor scar, nor scar her skin, but she must die. Her beauty and her innocence almost overpower him. Then the beautiful and evocative lines put out the light and then put out the light. Yes, it would be easy to put out the light of the bedroom lamp. And then when he puts out the light of her life, what can ever bring it back? What can recall her life? So this is why he cries out in pain. I know not where is that Promethean fire that can thy light relume. So again, for the students in this group, uh, Promethean fire refers to the fire, the primal fire that Prometheus, the great Titan, brought from heaven as a gift to mankind. But even this primal fire, this Promethean fire, cannot reignite a human life. And so it's amazing, I feel, how so much has been compressed and so much revealed of Othello's complex motivation in this single soliloquy. On the stage, and even if you're really listening, uh, there is terrific tension between the audience's sympathy for the innocent Desdemona, but at the same time, Shakespeare has managed to generate a kind of understanding of Othello. He is not justified, but he is torn between jealousy and love, and I think we all do understand that. Just to give us a break from all this intensity, let's do a quick quiz, just trivia, nothing heavy. So again, in your chat boxes, uh, you might like to enter uh, the responses in what, whichever order you feel like. Some are easy, some are slightly more difficult. So all of you have got the 23rd of April. That's good. Good recall. Right. So, so I think, I think you have all got uh, quite a few. Uh, Rishonanda Singh, his uh, father was a glove maker. Raja Lakshmi, he went to grammar school, right? Stratford, lots of you have mentioned. So you've left out just a few of the difficult ones. Uh, Anne Hathaway was his wife, Saras, very good. Um, so let's look at the answers to the Shakespeare quiz. Uh, this you all knew, so I won't bother with that. Stratford upon Avon, Avon was a river. Uh, Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway, a lot is made of the fact that she was older than him. Uh, now look at this. What did he leave her in his will? Their second best bed. Okay, it wasn't their best bed. He is very specific about saying their second best bed. And behind this hands, hangs a tail. But that's a conversation for another day. Then the names of his twin children were Judith, <clears throat> and Hamlet, uh, Hamlet, not Hamlet, and the boy, Hamlet, probably died of the plague. 
His eldest daughter was Susanna. Then his father's business uh, that you all knew. He went to school, right? Contemporary writers, Marlowe, Ben Johnson, and there a whole lot of those, uh, his rivals you could have mentioned. And now this is a very interesting uh, uh, fact in which Shakespeare's play is a mirror actually brought on stage and then dashed to the ground. Uh, this happens, happens in King Richard II. Uh, it's a very dramatic scene. Uh, King Richard is uh, forced to hand over the crown to Bolingbroke and he asks that a mirror be brought in and he looks at it to see what his face looks like now that it is bankrupt of his majesty. And then in a fit of petulance, he dashes it to the ground and says, there it is, smashed in a hundred shivers. Uh, I don't have time to deal with this today, but you must read it. It's very dramatic. It's beautiful poetry. So now let's get, get back uh, to the poem by Jeremy Lawrence. Now here he's talking about the perfect glass. So this was the second part. This is the second metaphor I was planning to deal with. And where did you find the mirror will, the perfect glass to show us as we are, troubled and tormented, yet still wondering at the stars. So this line I've highlighted in purple because I thought it summed up the conflicted, contradictory nature of human beings, that although we are deeply uh, tormented and troubled, we yet have this other aspect of wondering at the stars, at the beauty around us. And how was it that you knew us all so well, every man, every woman, every struggling soul and spirit, what it means to be here, to be human? And oh, the star-crossed lovers, there are star-crossed lovers in almost every play. Uh, a Midsummer Night's Dream is a comedy where almost everyone is, has got their lines crossed. And then we have the power mad and ruthless kings, lots of kings there. And uh, people say that Shakespeare acted as a king in many of these plays, uh, but we're not sure of that. We do know that he acted a couple of uh, parts in his plays. How was it that you knew us all, that you knew everything? So another point that I just wanted to mention was that these are not themes which are special to Shakespeare and that meant something only in Elizabethan times. The star-crossed lovers, our love jihad, the power mad and ruthless kings, dictatorships on the rise everywhere. Well, uh, this is something that we can relate to. So this is what it meant to talk about the, the, per, the mirror or the perfect glass. Now let's look at Hamlet, who is the epitome of troubled and tormented man. And Hamlet, however, looks at life through a very distorted mirror. And part of it, of course, you remember the horrifying revelations of the ghost of his, uh, made by the ghost of his father, which kind of deepened Hamlet's melancholy and his cynicism. Very interestingly, when Hamlet uh, appears on the pub in public for the first time in the play, everyone else, the other courtiers, everyone's dressed in their colorful best. It's a wedding feast, wedding feast for his mother and his uncle. So it's not surprising that Hamlet appears in stark black. So that's a real contrast. Let's just listen to this. And then it's quite interesting. There are lots of parallels with our time as well, particularly in this mention of a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors, Corona. Speaking to Rosencrantz, in Act 2, Scene 2, Hamlet says, I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, foregone all custom of exercises, and indeed it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me 
a sterile promontory, this most excellent canopy the air. Look you, this brave o'erhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire. Why, it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me, no nor woman neither, though by your smiling, you seem to say so. So, I said before that Hamlet looks at life through a distorting mirror. I don't think anyone will argue that the world that Hamlet sees is the world as it really is, because he's looking only at the dark side. Hamlet's inner world is so dark that nothing, not even the beauty of the sky or the beauty of the earth, can impress him. This majestical roof, fretted with golden fire, to him, is just a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors, a germ-laden cloud of gases, very much as we think of the corona-ridden atmosphere. We're not sure whether the coronavirus is transmitted uh, through air. So we have this feeling that we are surrounded by this cloud of gases, which is poisonous. Worse than this, he is disgusted, not impressed at all by the great qualities of human beings, although he runs through everything in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. But then he sums it up. But And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me, nor woman neither. That, that line has been lost, I'm sorry. Uh, nor wo woman neither, though by your smiling, he was talking to Rosencrantz, you seem to say so. Now let's take a little bit of a break from the miasma of Hamlet's world. Moving away from Hamlet's melancholy and cynicism, it is but a step to Belmont, where we find a couple gazing soulfully at the stars. The mood is very different here, Listen to the sound of music which Lorenzo suggests is the singing of the stars and planets. The Merchant of Venice, Act 5, Scene 1, Belmont. Lorenzo is speaking to Jessica, the daughter of Shylock the Jew. If Shylock had known about it, he would have been most upset. And later when he found out about it, the poor man, you have to pity him. Uh, he... He started yelling about my daughter and my ducats, my daughter and my ducats. He was equally upset about losing his money and his daughter. Anyway, that's, uh, that happens later. So now let's just think about Lorenzo. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank. Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness and the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Sit, Jessica. Look how the floor of heaven is thick and laid with patterns of bright gold. There is not the smallest orb which thou beholdest, but in his motion, like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubims. I always thought it was cherubim. I don't know what Shakespeare thought the plural of cherub was. Such harmony is in immortal souls, but whilst this muddy vesture of decay doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. So this, you will agree, is very different from the previous mood. And here we uh, should look at the language, the, the amazing flexibility and versatility of Shakespeare's lexis and, his, and the structures which help him to reflect Lorenzo's lyricism, his lyrical flights of fancy, as well as Hamlet's despair.
holding the mirror up to nature. And in conclusion, we're nearing a conclusion. We return briefly to Prince Hamlet, who is organizing a play within a play, a very ingenious device. You must read it if you haven't already. The idea is to trap the conscience of his uncle, Claudius, the king. He hopes that his uncle will see in the play a mirror of his own foul deeds and be cut to the heart. In fact, Claudius does see something in the play which upsets him very much and he rushes from the scene. Anyway, uh, Prince Hamlet advises the actors of this play, play within the play, not to exaggerate, not to be bombastic and explains why. For anything so overdone is contrary to the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, is to show virtue her feature, scorn her own image and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. So if Hamlet is saying this, then we can assume that his creator, Shakespeare, also felt that the end purpose of playing or acting, playing, they called actors, players, and they called acting, playing, Elizabethan times. Uh, so Shakespeare would have felt that the end purpose of acting or playing is to hold the mirror up to nature, to show the individual strengths and weaknesses like virtue here, scorn, which probably uh, he's talking about pride and disdain and all the, um, uh, and all uh, the less attractive uh, side of human beings, and also to reflect the age and body of the time. That is to reflect faithfully what was going on in, uh, in that particular time. But what is interesting to note is that whether it is in L Lorenzo's Belmont or Juliet, Romeo and Juliet's Verona or in Hamlet's Elsinore, the world we see is more or less society as it was in Shakespeare's England. I don't think Shakespeare went and tried to find out what the customs were in Verona or in Venice. He wasn't bothered. It was just a setting and his actors reflected uh, the world of Shakespeare's day and his and England. Let's go on now to our last excerpt from this play by Jeremy Lawrence. And how is it that you knew everything? And how is it that what you showed us still touches us today? It seems we've moved on. We've changed, of course, in this most sophisticated age. But truth be told, you're still with us and your text still burns upon the page. Yes, we've progressed, we have changed. Lots of things have changed. It's a more sophisticated age. Then how is it that Shakespeare is still, still relevant? How is it that his words still seem to burn upon the page, that people are still fascinated by Shakespeare? And he goes on, we are still captive, still listening amazed, and we're still pictured in your gaze. So it looks as if it's not the actors, but the audience who is seen in Shakespeare's eyes. And uh, Jeremy Lawrence concludes by saying, yes, yes, we're still standing on your stage. So it looks as if the tables have been well and truly turned. We were, we were here to look at the actors and the characters and to see how, uh, what they're like and what Shakespeare ex um, has revealed about them. But now it seems as if the actors and the characters are just people like us and that we are the people who are standing on the stage. So I just thought that this would be an interesting thought uh, for you to take away. Just a minute. Human nature hasn't changed that much, has it? And society is still a mixture of virtue and vice. Before we call it a day, I thought I would play for you a song from Shakespeare. 
not many of us may be aware of the wealth of songs which brighten up the place and give them a brisker tempo. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a teacher in college who taught us Shakespeare and she also happened to be our music uh, teacher, our choir mistress. So she taught us a couple of plays. We, we didn't sing it very well, but uh, that doesn't have to happen. Um, so as you might expect, the songs in his plays also unveil character and motive. And they set the mood, very important. So this is the clown song from Twelfth Night. The clown song from Twelfth Night. When that I was and a little tiny boy with a hey ho, the wind and the rain. When that I was and a little tiny boy with a hey ho, the wind and the rain. A foolish thing was but a toy For the rain it rain on every day For the rain it rain on every day But when I came to man's estate With a lay of the wind and the rain Its names and thieves men shut their gate for the rain it rain on every day, and the rain it rain up every day. A great while ago, the world began with the lay of the wind and the rain, but that's all what a play is done. I will strive to please you every day. And I strive to please you every day. And the rain, it rain out every day. So some of the more familiar songs are Oh Mistress Mine, Where Are You Roaming? Also from Twelfth Night. The Willow Song by Desdemona in Othello. Fear no more the heat of the sun, a lovely requ requiem, a funeral song from Cymbeline, full fathom five thy father lies from the tempest, and where the bee sucks, there suck I, aerial song. I will now play aerial song from the tempest, sung by Maya Chandi. So you see that in this song, uh, it's not just the beauty of the music uh, and the singing, uh, it's also that the essence of Ariel's carefree and light-hearted character are very delicately portrayed. So whatever Shakespeare writes works at different levels, and I think this is part of something that we need to do. Uh, let me move on uh, to a very brief postscript. I cannot overemphasize the importance of she reading Shakespeare aloud. And that's why I had so many texts uh, read aloud today. 
act the plays out if possible, even if only a scene or two, just see how your students will love it. Shakespeare was never meant to be read silently, I feel. The language, the structures, the rhyme, the rhythm, and the power, the sheer power of iambic pentameter are all heard only when Shakespeare is read aloud, recited, declaimed, or otherwise performed, either individually or in groups. For the meaning to emerge, particularly in the case of students who do not really understand English well, and then for them to understand the, the language of Shakespeare well would be difficult. But the sound of the language is absolutely essential for the meaning to emerge. And I would suggest keep the footnotes to the minimum and let the intelligent student guess, infer, and grasp at meaning. So I've come to the end of what was on my playlist. And I think I will now hand you back to the moderator, Aisha. Thank you, ma'am. I will take it on from here. A lovely and warm evening to our most valued attendees, Organizing Committee of LTI, respected academicians and beloved friends. Now it's time for the interactions. We request the attendees to use the chat as well as your WhatsApp group to ask Talita ma'am uh, your queries. Um, as is evident, uh, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm. So uh, Talita ma'am, I think I can begin with the first question. The first question is uh, from Dr. Lab Singh. And uh, he asks, how to make uh, Shakespeare more popular beyond the students of literature and get into a common English reader's mind? This is his question. OK, uh, Dr. Lab Singh, I would say that uh, if we don't include Shakespeare in the syllabus, how on earth are we going to make it popular? It isn't uh, just some uh, Shakespeare isn't just a writer who wrote 400 years ago. I mean, he is a classic. He's so relevant, uh, as I've hoped, as I hope I've shown uh, to a small extent in this presentation. And if people act it out a little bit, that would really make it come to life. Uh, I remember we had a Shakespeare week um, some years back, 2014, in Cochin, and we had invited some uh, students from St. Birchman's College. And they acted some of the uh, scenes from Shakespeare. And it was beautiful. It was very, came, came alive. Uh, Ma'am, the next question is from Miss Lakshmi. Uh, she says, the new generation feels reading contemporary writers would help them con connect better with the world. The universal appeal of the bard is something they are oblivious about. So what is your take on this trend? Uh, well, it's the same, basically, as what I said before. If uh, teachers of English feel that um, Shakespeare is irrelevant, then the new generation is never going to uh, encounter Shakespeare. But you know, the new generation would respond, I'm sure, if they were shown clips uh, of movies, uh, audio clips or film clips, and that would make uh, Shakespeare come alive to them, and that would intrigue them and want them to know more about it. Just to give you an example, you know that mirror scene, why I didn't include it today is because I keep talking about it in every... Uh, Shakespeare day we have. But you know, when you hear about somebody who asks for a mirror to be brought in and then smashes it on the ground, don't you think that that would be intriguing to the student? So I think the point is we need to know a lot about Shakespeare and then we can make Shakespeare come alive for our students. Uh, we have a very interesting question from Dr. P. N. Ramani. Uh, it says, isn't it true of all great literature that it is a mirror up to nature? How was Shakespeare different or unique in this re uh, respect? No, no, obviously, I mean, all great writers and even poor writers, I guess, uh, would hold a mirror up to nature. But the point is, how effectively do they do so? And you see, uh, what I've tried to, try, uh, tried to show is that there are subtleties that Shakespeare can bring out. I'm not saying that he's the only one who can bring it out. But for instance, we see Hamlet looking at the world through a distorting mirror. So he is, uh, Shakespeare is holding up a mirror to nature. But here in this case, it's something that shows you the world as it isn't really. This is the world of uh, Hamlet's mind. And I'm sure this would be very interesting to students of psychology as well. So we could have a lot of uh, uh, inter-subject discussion on this. Yes. 
Uh, there is a question from uh, Ms. Arunima who says, how is it possible to simply uh, teach uh, Shakespeare for young children? Plus, there is another interesting uh, question from Dr. Seema Singh who says, do you think that uh, Shakespeare's warm understanding of human beings and his humanistic insights is what makes him relevant even today? Well, the question seems connected, ma'am. Could you take that? <laughs> yeah, OK. So uh, how to uh, I'll just take Arunima's first. How to simplify Shakespeare for children, right? Yes. Simplify. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, but uh, children love Shakespeare. You've just got to know what to select. Uh, I'd suggest uh, pick up a couple of poems. Um, uh, there, there are lots of lovely poems. I remember my niece reading out uh, that little bit from A Midsummer Night's Dream about you spotted snakes with double tongues. And she was not uh, acquainted with Shakespeare at all. And when I told her to read it, she thoroughly enjoyed it. And we loved it as well. She was a child. Uh, and uh, so this is just one example. But you can take small uh, scenes from Shakespeare. Uh, just to give you a really wacky example, I had students in the British School of Colombo. And we just said, you do whatever you want. They were studying for their exams. And they didn't have really time to waste on Shakespeare. So I said, OK, you do whatever you feel like. And they uh, did the Romeo and Juliet scene, the, the very first scene where, uh, you know, the uh, the Capulets and the Montagues are fighting. And they did it using knives, bread and butter knives, okay, table knives. And in the background, they had Bhangra music going on. It was hilarious. But then over all this, we heard, we heard Shakespeare. So there's no end to what you can do. I mean, Shakespeare is a storehouse. He's, he's just amazingly versatile. All right, ma'am. Uh, there's a question from Mr. Inamul Kabir Pasha and uh, Dr. Vaibha uh, Shabhi. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Inamul says, what place should we give to Shakespeare in the time of popular literature? And Dr. Vaibha was asking, dear ma'am, what is the contemporary relevance of uh, Shakespeare's literature, which you seem to have partially answered. Would you like to add on to that? Mm, sorry. Uh, could you? Uh, huh, OK, right. What place should we give to Shakespeare in this time? Is that the one? Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, in this time of popular literature, OK. Uh, Shakespeare is popular. He's extremely popular. So I mean, uh, the point is, if we, I mean, OK, we are not Britishers. But you know, uh, when I, uh, on a visit to the Globe Theatre, I found that there was a Lithuanian group acting Hamlet. So Shakespeare has acted in every language of the world. So I don't think that uh, we can argue that uh, he is not popular. If he is known, he would be popular. So our job is to introduce uh, students to Shakespeare. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there's one more question by Mr. Nahi Ahmad. He says, will it be OK to translate and enact the plays in regional languages for the better understanding of the students? Can teachers do that? Sure. I mean, teachers can do whatever they want and whatever they think works. But just speaking for myself, you know, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to tell a student the plot. So if you want to uh, summarize the plot for your students in the regional language, by all means do that. But if at all possible, give them a small clip from the play. Read it. Don't bother to explain. Just let them hear the sound. I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, uh, I just don't know how. Uh, um, I mean, some of how, I don't understand how some of the language works. It's so stirring. So I would say, let them listen to it. For instance, uh, why don't you just uh, uh, ask, ask the students to read double, double, toil and trouble? OK, just two lines. Don't go, go, don't go further than that. Give them a cauldron and ask them to say that double, double, toil and trouble. And you know, they will hear the, the, they'll hear the words, they'll hear the sound, and that will get them excited. But uh, this is not to say that you can't translate. By all means, translate. Uh, enact the plays. I'm sure it's been done, but I'm just saying, surely you don't want to uh, eliminate Shakespeare's language from mm -hmm. the equation. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so um, since uh, we are coming uh, to the end of the allotted time, uh, we can summarize the question answer sessions as, uh, you know, pertaining to one particular thing, because uh, if you take uh, since Homer, no poet seems to have come near Shakespeare in originality, freshness and uh, boldness of imagery, because he endeavored to make his style as uh, symbolical as is possible without smothering the sense, which is why we're getting such interesting questions. 
uh, because the way uh, you gave us uh, the uh, your sight into the metaphors is surely showing that metaphors are surest uh, mode of doing this too. So uh, thank you so much. With that, uh, we come to the end of uh, the question and answer session. Thank you all for the lovely interaction. And I should uh, move on to the vote of thanks. Um, it's an honor uh, to have been asked to offer a vote of thanks on the occasion of the 60, 62nd uh, LTI webinar, The Glove and the Mirror, Metaphors to Explore Shakespeare. On behalf of LTI, I'm truly happy to express our gratitude to the honorable and respected speaker, Ms. Uh, Talita Matthew, for her graceful, enthusiastic talk and the lively quizzes in today's session. Your session to, took us into the beautiful world of Shakespeare and the metaphors. I want to thank uh, the speaker who gave her vital time from her busy schedule to grace this occasion. I'm sure all of us are inspired by your highly sparkling words. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I thank our host, Dr. Praveen Sam, Assistant Professor of SSN College of Engineering, Chennai, for taking such meticulous, meticulous care and uh, assisting us uh, to uh, the extensive amount of making the 62nd LTI webinar, The Club in the Mirror, a memorable one. Thank you so much, sir. I also would like to thank Dr. Ashwati A, uh, Assistant Professor of uh, NSS College for Women, Tiruvananthapuram, who so graciously moderated the former session. It was a pleasure to be with you. We are thankful to all the participants for attending the LTI webinar. I also take this occasion to thank the dedicated and uh, well-motivated entire committee of LTI team, as well as the audience for representing their valuable views. We are indeed fortunate to have such renowned personalities from academic, industry, and other areas here today. I'm sure that we will uh, you know, continue to get your support, your significant support to LTI from the, diff uh, the diverse patrons and academic groups in the future too. We thank you for being with us and uh, it has been a pronounced pleasure for all of us. Have a great day ahead. But before I break off uh, a word, uh, let me pass uh, the, uh, the, uh, this particular moment uh, to Dr. Praveen. Uh, thank you, Aisha, ma'am. Thank you, Aisha. I mean, thank you for this encouraging and uh, beautiful moderation. Uh, dear uh, participants, thank you for uh, patiently listening to the webinar, and thank you for asking those questions as well. Uh, so here I have uh, a few announcements. Uh, first, is, uh, as you see on, on the screen, it's our next webinar, webinar 63, titled Empowering Teachers to Integrate Technology, Challenges and Solutions. Uh, the resource person uh, will be Dr. M.S. Xavier Pradeep Singh, Assistant Professor of English, St. Joseph's College, Trishtapalli. Uh, also, I have another announcement. Uh, this is about uh, a eight-day FTP uh, conducted by LTI in association with uh, Sri Ramakrishna Engineering College, Kramato, uh, on reading back to basics from screen flippers page turners so the uh, the date uh, of the web I mean of the FDP program starts from 23rd uh, to 31st of August 2021 so I request the participants to uh, participate in these events and continue your learning experience thank you so much have a good day bye thank you ma'am